Thank you. Good evening. Good evening and welcome to Allowed at Central Library. Um, I'm Louise Steinman, the Program Director for the Library Foundation of Los Angeles. And tonight, philosopher and cultural critic Slavoj Žižek, author of God in Pain, Inversions of Apocalypse, subjects the three major faith-based religions to a respectful but ruthless critical examination in conversation with God's own biographer, Jack Miles. So we think it's a great matchup. We're sorry that um, Boris uh, Gunevich was able to join us tonight but, um, as planned, but I can assure you it's going to be a very lively evening nonetheless. Philosopher, provocateur, and cultural critic Slavoj Žižek is internationally recognized for his work on psychoanalysis. He grew up in the former Yugoslavia, well located, as he's noted, to see what was going on and well inoculated to resist any illusions about the East or the West. He teaches at the European Graduate School and has been a visiting professor at the University of Paris, Columbia, and Princeton, among other institutions. He's the founder and president of the Society for Theoretic a psychoanalysis in Ljubljana, Slovenia, and has now written more than 50 books and had his work translated into 20 languages. His book topics range from Christianity to the films of David Lynch, and his work, as I'm sure you know, cuts across disciplines. His recurring themes are ideology, belief, revolution, and love. He's a master of counterintuitive thinking and a keen observer, indeed a connoisseur, of the paradoxes that underpin our perception of reality. Inquiring minds around the world are invigorated and expanded by Slavoj Žižek's ability to connect the minutia of popular culture to the big abstract problems of existence. And as he has said, I believe the first duty of philosophy is making you understand what deep shit you're in. <laughs> Our interlocutor tonight is Jack Miles, who was game for an allowed rematch with Slavoj Žižek. Jack is Senior Fellow for Religious Affairs with the Pacific Council on International Policy, and he's Distinguished Professor of English and Religious Studies at UC Irvine. He's been a MacArthur Fellow, won the Pulitzer in 1996 for God, a biography, which has been translated into 16 languages. And he's currently General Editor of the forthcoming Norton Anthology of World Religions. Jack is an inspiring and generous member of LA's intellectual community and the world of ideas. And I can tell you if the uh, conversation in the green room is any indication, you're in for a great evening. Please welcome Slavoj Žižek and Jack Miles. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. It's a pleasure to be with you again. This evening, we're going to be talking about Slavoj Žižek's new book, God in Pain, Inversions of Apocalypse. Let me begin with the subtitle. What is an inversion of apocalypse? Apocalypse uh, is a proclamation that the world is about to end. So an inversion of apocalypse must be then, in some sense, a proclamation that the world is about to begin. And if it is God invulnerable, God immutable, omnipotent, eternal, who is most associated with the world ending, then perhaps there is a connection between God in pain and the world about to begin. That's a topic that we will find our way around to during the course of, of the evening. I thought that I might uh, begin uh, drawing a kind of line from the very beginning of, of my book, God, a biography, to the subject matter of this book. That book uh, begins, of course, with the beginning of the Tanakh, the Hebrew scriptures, where God creates the world rather as a host might uh, prepare a home uh, for entertaining a distinguished guest. And who is that uh, distinguished guest? The distinguished guest is the human species. It is the first couple, the man and the woman. And what is God's uh, motive for, for uh, creating uh, humankind? It is because he wants an image of himself. He decides to create th this pair in his own image and likeness. And why does anyone want an image? Why do you look in the mirror? You look in the mirror because you want to see yourself. You have your portrait drawn because you want to look at it. So in what way, 
Slavoj. <laughs> His mind is is spinning, is racing here. I mean, I can I can kind of feel the vibrations. In what way is God in pain the fulfillment of God's wish? Is Jesus Christ on the cross the fulfillment of God's wish to see himself? Uh, that's a good question, and from what I, I don't know a lot, know of, you know this much more, history of theology, this was a great topic of debates. Not only this, but even the most elementary questions. Like, whenever I'm in debate, sometimes Europe, I am with especially Catholic bishops and so on, I noticed how often it is easy to embarrass them by asking the most elementary questions. Like once I asked them, why did God have to die on the cross? And they looked at me as if I'm asking a prohibited questions. And it's true because, you know, like the moment you go into this uh, 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 exchange of commodities topic, like to pay the price for our sins, you are lost. It doesn't work. First, to pay the price for our sins to whom? You must know this better than me. The only consequent answer would be that there should be another guy, like the devil. Mm -hmm. And this was, I think, one of the early heresies, no? Mm -hmm. yes. that, that God says to the devil, I love humanity so much that I give you my son, to ransom you, his page to say, yeah, 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 yeah. That's so that then uh, some people claim uh, it is so that uh, it is uh, because justice must be done. I, we are in paganism here, which means as if there is even above God. This is typical, I think, pre Christian idea that God is not really the top, there is some kind of a uh, 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 cosmic destiny, justice to which even God has to be subordinated. Then the worst answer for me is because if God were just to pardon us without this spectacle of death on the cross, then uh, we wouldn't be grateful to God. But wait a minute, God becomes here a disgusting narcissist who really wants to be loved and, you know, it's like PR of God. Let's do a nice spectacle so that... and. Uh, 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 so, uh, the most obscene answer here for me is that of Nicolas Malbranche, mm -hmm. who says that uh, God created humanity. He goes even further from this mirror image. He says God wanted to be admired. He even goes as far as to say that without Jesus Christ's sacrifice, we wouldn't all be lost, but there we would all be redeemed automatically. Malbranche says directly, God threw uh, through us all into sin so that he could save some of us to show gratitude. So we have here clearly what we call a perverse God. Mm -hmm. So you know what I mean? What I mean by this, I'm not just, I hope, losing our precious time. What I want no. to say is, this is not an argument against Christianity, but quite of the contrary. It makes my point, which I think at least at some level consonates, if I may also use like you this, terminology from our youth hippie era. We have a positive vibration here with what you said, that there is something that is a little bit impenetrable even today. Something tremendous happens in the very focus of Christian experience, which is then cover, covered up with the usual dogma and so on and so on. Which is why I love, maybe you know the anecdote, historical one. Uh, when Napoleon was crowned emperor by the Pope, you know what happened, that's the legend. A Pope approached him with the crown, Napoleon took the crown and put it himself on his head. And then, that's the story, Pope told Napoleon something wonderful. He told him, I know what you want to do, you want to ruin the church. Let me tell you, you will fail. Because we, Catholic institution, are trying to do this to ruin Christianity for 2,000 years, we didn't <laughs> succeed, so you will not. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that, <coughs> Uh, not to provoke Christians, but to bring us to the central experience, which I claim is today more precious than ever. I like to focus on these problematic points. Like, for example, uh, another question which I used to embarrass my Catholic friends, uh, which is, I just asked them, in all innocence, how exactly do you read 
You can imagine me as an old-fashioned communist, how I like that. Those fa- statements from the gospel, you know, I don't bring peace and love, I bring sword and fire. If you don't hate your parents, blah, 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 you are not my follower. How do you read this? Because then I notice that there is a whole system of de-traumatizing this statement. You know, like, no, God doesn't, like one uh, Catholic theologian uh, uh, told me, yeah, you shouldn't read it too literally. It just means that God, you know, they gave me a kind of a shitty uh, Jedi version from Star Wars. <laughs> this, you know, uh, the, 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 the Obi-Wan Kenobi stuff, don't get too attached to earthly objects. Like, you can love your neighbors, but you should love me more, which is for me a ridiculous obscenity, as if God is a jealous guy who said, love your wife, okay, but remember, I'm here, I want to be loved a little bit more. <laughs> the best answer was given to me by a Polish bishop, who, when I asked him this question, what do, do those lines mean? Told me, it was very funny, told me, my God, I wasn't prepared for this question. Why did you? And I told him, like F, sorry to use the word again, F three points U. You had time 2,000 years to prepare for this question. Like, it's not that I brought something new now, it's in the Bible. But again, I'm not saying this to provoke. I think this brings us to the challenge. And my very simple solution to this challenge is that when, when in the Bible it said, if you don't hate your father, mother, it's not father, mother as persons, it's father, mother stands there for entire power edifice social hierarchy. That's for me one of the big news of Christianity. An egalitarian community outside of social hierarchy is possible. That's for me the big news. In other, maybe I'm here too pro-Western, but nonetheless, in other so-called pagan religions, in order to achieve this point of, let's call it, absolute equality, it's only in death or in nirvana where all structures dissolve. But this idea that you can have a collective, and this is for me what Holy Ghost is, an egalitarian collective outside hierarchical structure, this for me, for example, is, a, is, is, is tremendous, a tremendous news, and so on and so on. Something unheard of. And when you mentioned uh, uh, God, God in pain, my reading, so now I'll finally answer your question, uh, <laughs> Apocalypse, the end of the world, and so on, for me, the key was always uh, the book of Job, which I think, if you permit me to say this, it will sound a provocation, but I mean it extremely seriously in an engaged way, is the first great work of critique of ideology. If I were to do, you know, like the best of critique of ideology, forget about Marx, Freud, let's begin with the book of Job. Why? Are you aware what a tremendous thing happens there? Uh, we know, okay, let's, that's, let's forget about that stuff. I think it doesn't matter, you know, that comical part, it, you know, at, at the beginning, how they have a nice uh, evening lunch together, God and devil, and they debate that. Uh, but, but what happened there is that, okay, things go terribly wrong for Job. And then ideology enters. The three or four theological friends come, remember, and each of them tries to convince Job that there is a deeper meaning to his suffering. The point is not that he's guilty or not. The point is that, you know, the first one says, even if you think you did nothing wrong, God is just, so you must have done something wrong without knowing it. The other guy says, God is just uh, testing you, blah, blah. And I think the greatness of Job is that he doesn't say, I'm innocent. He just insists, no, all these catastrophes that fell on me have no meaning. And then comes the first, occurs the first miracle, God comes, you remember, and says every word that you, Job, said is true. He totally dismisses any justification, theological, and then comes the crucial point. Well, I follow my beloved Gilbert Keith Chesterton. Then, nonetheless, Job asks God, okay, but let's, I put it in popular term, but let's cut the crap. Nonetheless, why did all this happen to me? Then, for me, I wonder how you would react to it. I'm here on Chesterton's side. It's the big enigma. That answer by God, you know, where were you when I was creating these, that, monsters, is usually read as an extreme arrogance of God, 
emphasizing the infinite gap that separates us from God's total perspective. Like, who are you, a tiny piece of shit, even knowing that? Chesterton does something which is, for me, so shockingly simple but profound. He turns around the perspective, and his God's answer is for Chesterton that is the following one. You think you are in trouble, but look at the entire universe that I created. It's all one big mess. Everything goes wrong and so on. That, it's, that in a refined way, like God expresses his perplexity at his own creation. I think that this is maybe the, an incredible ethical revolution. Because this is already the first step out of this traditional pagan view where justice means you should be at your own place, do your particular duty, and so on and so on. You know, this withdrawal, which then, I think, culminates in the death of Christ. What dies on the cross for me? Not a messenger of God. It's not that God is up there, he sends his son, okay, sorry guys, you screwed it up now, maybe in thousand years, another Messiah. As Hegel says, what dies on the cross is God of beyond himself. It's precisely God as that transcendent power which somehow secretly pulls the strings. This is, I think, the secret of Christianity. That precisely God no longer can be conceived as, you know, we are in shit, we don't know what's going on, but we can be assured that there is nonetheless an old guy up there who secretly pulls the strings and so on and so on. This God abdicates. I think that something tremendous happens in Christianity. Because remember, after the death of Christ, we don't get back to the Father. What we get is Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is the egalitarian community bound by love. You know what Christ says when he's asked how will we recognize if you are here? When there is love between the two of you, I am there. It's just the immanence of an emancipatory collective. This was the deepest insight of even good conservative theologists, like Paul Claudel, definitely not a communist, no, said something very profound. He said the deepest lesson of Christianity is not we can trust God, but God can't do anything without us. God has to trust us. So for me, again, this is a tremendously important message of freedom. Again, as my beloved Chesterton said, it's not a... a Chesterton said, uh, in uh, all other religions you have atheists, people who don't believe in God. But Chesterton's reading of those famous, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani, Father, why have you forsaken me? Is that only in Christianity, and for him this is crucial, God himself becomes for a moment an atheist. And this is so tremendously important for me. Are, are, I think far from this fashionable idea that the Christian era, you know, all that Aquarius bullshit is over and we are entering a new era. Yes, we are, but I don't like this new era. It's neo, <laughs> neo-paganism and so on. I claim that today precisely we should stick to this tremendous explosive impact. We are still not ready to confront it of what Christianity is truly telling us. Which is why I like to say paradoxically that to be an atheist, but don't be afraid, not in the Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens sense, but this authentic atheism in the sense of experiencing the radical absence of any transcendent guarantee. And in this sense, for me, Stalinist communists or some Darwinists are not atheists. You know, they always have some higher figure of necessity and so on. You have to go through Christianity. My formula is... Not just that I try to give some atheist reading of Christianity, how God is really man, that's bullshit, but that only through the Christian experience can you reach the abyss of what I call atheism for me, which is something, again, much more radical than all the bullshit of uh, Richard Dawkins and so on. My problem with them is that, of course, in some stupid sense, it's true what they are saying. We are probably the result of evolution and so on and so on. But, but it simply absolutely doesn't work as there is absolutely no insight for me in Dawkins and so on of 
how a religion effectively works. It's a, a whole dimension is missing there. They're even, I claim, mostly totally wrong about the status of belief. Belief is for me something very mysterious. Like, do we really believe? How do we believe? I claim that in contrast to those conservative critics who claim we are entering an era of disbelief, a godless world, hedonist, and so on and so on, I disagree totally. First, we don't live in an era of hedonism. We live in an era of strictly controlled, regulated hedonism. You know, like, what do I mean by this? On my flight from Europe here, I read in Hemispheres, the Journal of uh, United Airlines, one of the most depressing uh, articles that I've read. It was an article celebrating sex, why sex is good. But it describes it in these pragmatic terms. They say a good orgasm helps heart working, blood circulation is good, <laughs> kissing fortifies your lips and so on, whatever good, I don't know. It's an, you know, this is how. Yes, sex, but healthy sex. Yes, drink, but uh, b b b beer without alcohol, whatever, whatever. The only true hedonists today are those who take drugs and especially for some strange reason, those who smoke. And which is why, uh, to avoid a misunderstanding, I don't smoke. And I agree, we should screw the companies. But nonetheless, there is something <laughs> deeply symptomatic in how we, uh, in this obsession with the danger of smoking. Like, I had a wonderful experience in Chicago half a year ago. In front of a hotel, I was waiting for a friend to pick me up, and there was a distinguished old black gentleman there smoking. And he told me, of course, with a little bit of irony, but nonetheless, there was a bitter truth in it. He told me that he's from the South, and when he was very young, he still remembers racism, I mean, how he was oppressed at black. And then he said, but it's not as bad as now being oppressed for smoking, you know. <laughs> because just think about in Hollywood, who is smoking today? Mostly terrorists who are afraid to blow themselves up, and so on and so on. This is the truth of our hedonism, as to believe. It's not true. We believe more than ever. We just invented something absolutely breathtaking. That beliefs, in order to function, to operate, don't have to be first-person beliefs. You can literally believe through others. You know, you know the formula of parents, like, we are atheists, but not to disappoint our children, we pretend to believe, you know, the Santa Claus story, you know. You ask a parent, do you believe in Santa Claus? Yet, are you stupid? Of course not, I buy the presents, but I <laughs> pretend it for my children. Then you ask the children, do you believe? They said, no, we pretend it not to disappoint our parents and to get the... <laughs> like, what's my point here? You have a belief which is nobody's belief. No one believes in the first person, <laughs> but it fully functions as a... So, social belief. Here, and now I will stop, I will not go the full Fide Fidel Castro way of talking for seven hours. Here, uh, you did a mega contribution. By you, I mean United States, especially you here, Hollywood. Uh, your greatest contribution to 20th century world culture, I would claim is, sorry, my old joke, can't laughter, you know. Are you aware what a strange phenomenon this is? You return in the evening, home. You open up a stupid show like Friends Cheers, and you are too tired to laugh. You just look. And the TV set laughs for you. It works, at least with me. Afterwards, I feel relieved as if I was laughing. So much about primitive people. We claim, because we have traditional examples of this, like, you know, the Buddhist uh, prayer wheels. You write a prayer, you put it there, you turn around the wheel and you can think about pornography, whatever, in reality you are praying. We are the same, this is scant laughter. And I claim that beliefs function in a strictly homologous way. What we need is not a believe in first person. We need to believe that there is someone who believes, even if that someone is purely hypothetical. So for me, the truly Christian gesture, now I'm approaching the end, is precisely to, to abandon this wait. objectified belief. Like, let me give you, now I conclude, an example of what I mean. And I hope you will agree that it would make the movie much better. 
Probably we all know uh, uh, Roberto Benini's film, I don't like it, uh, La Vita è Bella, Life is Beautiful. You know the story, father, son are taken to Auschwitz, father, in order to save the trauma, the son, to protect him for the trauma, tells him a bullshit story, that this is not really prison, it's just a big competition site where if you, we can live whenever we want, but if you remain to the end, there will be a big price, and so on and so on. You know what would have been a way, I wonder if you agree, to make it a much better desperate film, yeah. that the father were to discover at the very end, when he's to be shot, that the son knew this all the time. Just he pretended to believe his father to protect him. This would be the proper Christian reversal, as it were. And the movie, again, this is why I don't like it, it's not strong enough about it. Maybe it's time for me to stop, please. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was very good for a warm-up. <laughs> In other words, but where is the beef? <laughs> will you have to deliver something when you will stop bullshitting? I got the message. Okay. No, yeah. you, 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 you did actually get round to answering the question that I, that I, that I began with. But I, I'm, I'm going to digress for, for just a moment mm -hmm. with a reminiscence. When I first moved to, uh, to California in 1978, uh, I was attending a dinner party. And uh, a woman I didn't know, I had never met before, came up to me toward the end of the party and she said, I trust you. You're a trustworthy person. And uh, she went on to say that she and her husband had decided to, to leave Southern California. Uh, they didn't like it that there were so many Mexicans here. And they were going to go to Tasmania and begin a new life in Tasmania. Tasmania, south of Australia. Yeah, south of yeah. Australia, right. Uh, but they weren't sure that the Tasmania would work out for them, uh, so they wanted someone to, to to occupy their house, which was a beautiful house overlooking the Pacific, for a full year, rent-free, and would I be willing to do this? So I said I was willing to do this, and then I discovered uh, where they got their money. He was a laugh engineer. You mean for this kind of laughter and yes. so on? Yeah. He traveled all over the country with, uh, with very sophisticated recording uh, equipment, and he would record the laughter of, uh, of little girls on a picnic. Mm -hmm. He would uh, record the laughter of men in a sex club. Uh, he would, he would uh, uh, record polite laughter uh, in church or at a graduation. Every age. Uh, he also had uh, ethnic divisions, you know, uh, laughter at, uh, in a, in a uh, mm -hmm. black restaurant. You know, everything, everything was a little bit different. And he gave me some demonstrations. He had it all carefully worked out. Uh, and then it would go from titters, you know, to, to chuckles, to mm -hmm. guffaws, to, mm -hmm. you know, how it starts. Sometimes one person gives a little laugh and then it spreads. And then he, had, he also had ways of, of having the laughter rise and then die down. But then it stirred up again. And it was, uh, it was very uh, seriously engineered. And his office looked like an airplane cockpit, you know, it was full of all those controls. Mm. Can you connect this, this would really intrigue me, to the two previous facts, that they disliked Mexicans and that they trusted you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see a link here? <laughs> I, mean, I, would, I, I mean, this is my theoretical obsession, you know? I always like to make a system, like... Oh, well, I have, I mean, I have been... My, uh, I, I have been taken <clears throat> in the course of my lifetime for Russian, for Polish, for Armenian. Once an Arab a guy came up to me in Jerusalem and, and said to me, I saw your friend, I knew immediately he was an American, I saw you, I knew right away you were an Armenian. But I've never been taken for Mexican. So I, that was at least one strike in my favor that I, I was not a, one of them. Um, otherwise, I think it was, um, it was probably that touch of the clergyman that I still carry with me from my 10 years as a Jesuit seminarian. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, although this is lucky for you because I found this, I don't celebrate this, it's very sad, but you know, after all these pedophilia scandals in Europe, no? Not all clergymen, but Catholic priests are precisely the guys you shouldn't trust, that's the idea, <laughs> no? An Irish friend told me that 
Irish mothers are now telling, you know, when you send your kid in the evening to the store, don't talk to foreigners, especially if they are priests, you know. <laughs> and I'm not making fun of this. I mean, it's a very, very sad event, I think, because here I'm a very traditional moralist, my God. We need, maybe more than ever, serious, authentic moral authorities. And I'm not here playing a Christopher Hitchens jumping with joy when a church is losing its, uh, its authority and so on. No, I'm just saying that I, maybe we agree here. Maybe if you allow me, let's pretend to be democratic, even if we are not that. I can also ask you a question. For me, church is today, at the, not church, authentic religious feeling, at a big crossroad. On the one hand, yes, it can be an incredible mobile of authentic liberation, but I'm not here playing simply the humanist card of mm -hmm. that we can use it as a prop. It's an absolutely authentic experience, subjective experience, and so on. At the same time, it can be, as we can see, terribly misused. I violently agree with, again, this uh, Richard Dawkins brand, but you know, one of the partisans of this aggressive atheism, I think it was Steven Weinberg, said something which, unfortunately, it makes me sad, has just an element, not more, of truth. You know, when he said that uh, without religion, good people would be doing good things, bad people, bad things. But you need something like religion to make good people do bad things. <laughs> unfortunately, there is an element of truth in it. In what sense? Listen, I will be very simplistic here. We all are, I hope so, just at least most of us, relatively decent people. Like, sorry to be personal, if somebody were to tell me now, here you have a knife, pick out this guy's eyes and <laughs> the out, I would find, sorry to tell you, some problems with it, no? <laughs> so, I'm relieved. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> we do need some strong mythopoetic structure, religion, nationalist myth, as it were, to serve as a screen and to convince us that the horrors we are doing can be transubstantiated into a higher, deeper meaning, whatever. Which is why I think it's enough for uh, philosophy to be blamed. You know, we philosophers are blamed for everything. Plato, the first totalitarian, whatever. Why not start also with poetry? It's not a, an accident that the leader of Bosnian Serbs, Radovan Karadzic, was a poet. I claim to give you, to provoke you the formula, no ethnic cleansing without poetry, or something like poetry. No, 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 I love authentic poets. What I'm saying is that you must be, as it were, uh, desynthesized in some sense to be able to do horrors like rapes, ethnic cleansing, and so on. And I claim that it's, it's precisely this kind of uh, ethnic, founding, mythic, community founding poetry or sacred text religions, which can also do the job. And for example, it's not only we in the primitive Balkans. You remember some, it was over 10 years ago, Rwanda massacre. Mm -hmm. I asked friends, yes, there is now there a great poet who for 20 years was laying the foundations for the slaughter that happened and so on and so on. So this is for me the mega, mega dilemma today. I mean, how to, how to find the way here? Because, you, you know, uh, like, uh, for me, the message of Christianity is precisely the opposite of this need for transcendence. You know, like, what's the usual explanation of fundamentalisms today? That people are afraid of freedom, they, they, uh, this opening, so they lack firm values, so they take refuge in old structures. No, as I've written, as I'm writing for 15 years, I think this is only part of the truth. There is also the opposite truth, which is, which was, I was taught it when I visited Belgrade incognito in early 90s and met some people who were probably ethnic cleanslers, and you know, they gave me almost the lesson of a lifetime. They told me, you know, for me, they told me modern world is not world with too a world with too much freedom, 
but it's too oppressive. Like you have to follow rules all the way down, you know. Like he told me, frankly, I cannot speak dirty, it's politically incorrect. I cannot even beat my wife and so on and so on. They experienced modern reality is too regulated and for them becoming ethnic fundamentalist opened up a space for a kind of a false non attending freedom. Uh, sorry, yes, so like you know, I'm uh, doing work on behalf of my nation, everything is permitted, okay, let's rape, le let's kill whatever you want. Which is why I think Jacques Lacan, my psychoanalytic master figure, was right when he turned around Dostoevsky's famous, if there is no God, then everything is permitted. No, if there is God, but in a non-authentic, fundamentalist way, where you pretend to be an instrument of God, then everything is permitted to you. So, again, things are here much more complex. Arthur Kessler said uh, that the altruism of the individual was the egoism of the group. Yeah. And vox populi, vox dei, if, if God is substituted by, by the people, uh, then you can do anything in the name of the people, and, and that was uh, that that ethnicity that you just uh, uh, related to can operate even where you have a multi-ethnic state. You can you can do things in the name of democracy uh, that you would never permit yourself uh, as a decent individual. That's yeah. what you were talking about. Yeah. But also, what I find interesting here is nonetheless that with people, it gets. A little bit more complex, but I agree with you, namely in what sense, you know, people are never just people. One should always take a closer look as who pretends to speak for the people. There lies the catch, you That's know. Right. In, I think that paradoxically... No, but the individuals, you also have, have the fact that th those who, who, who claim to speak for the people, if they are poets, if they have that eloquence, then they can mobilize that, that capacity that we do have as human beings, and it's a marvelous capacity. But corruptio optimi pessima, you know, uh, the, it, it is the worst of our capacities when, uh, when misused, and that is our capacity to give, our capacity to, to immolate, to be self-sacrificial, yeah. to go to transcend uh, our, our narrow, uh, our personal needs. Uh, this, is, this is human greatness at its best. Uh, but at its worst, it, it makes the individual a tool of, of, of the, the worst demagogues. Even a self-exploiting self tool, because, for example, this is what always... Uh, first, yes, I deeply agree with you, which is why I even agree here, it's a little bit too simple, but it has an element of truth, the famous distinction by Jean-Jacques Rousseau between the proper good egotism and uh, perverted self-love. Right. He says that authentic egotism is in itself not bad because you care really for your own good, but then you rationally discover that you can only be happy when others also have a good time. He locates the problem into what later was called resentment, envy, and so on. This mm -hmm. fatal moment when you focus on what you perceive as the obstacle to your welfare so that destroying the obstacle means to you more than your own good. You know, like uh, we uh, in Slovenia, my nation, we are supposed to be, and I tend to agree, the nation of resentment, which is why we have numerous <laughs> stories like, for example, a fairy or a magician appears to a farmer and says, listen, I will give you a cow, but... Well, I warn you, I will give two cows to your neighbor. So the farmer says, no, rather take a cow of mine, kill her, eat, but take all, two of, from the neighbor, and so on and so on. You know, like, the other guy loses is more important that you... That's just like one of the parables of Jesus, of the, the workers in the vineyard. Yeah. He, 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 he promises a worker given a mount in the, in the morning. Uh, the worker agrees to that. He should be happy. It's a good wage. Mm -hmm. But then uh, the day is one half gone, and he hires a couple other workers, and he gives them the same wage. And the, the, end, and the day is almost over, and he hires yet further workers, and he gives them the same wage. And the first worker is furious. I've worked all day, and this is all you're giving me? But that's the wage he agreed to. 
So it wasn't that his wage was inadequate. Mm. It's only that he, he resented the fact that someone else was doing better. This is than a wonderful was. point. Because can I ask you another question? You know much more about the Bible. Uh, this is what I really admire in Gospels at the level of the texture of the text style. My general experience is that, you know, there is a difficult point, theological, and then Christ says, okay, I will tell you a parable, a story. Yes. But that story, instead of clarifying things, just messes things up even more. Yes. It's yes. as if Christ is playing there mm -hmm. a wonderful provocative game. You know, you know that. You don't, his parables precisely are not simple explanations. That's right. In the, and this I cannot but fully admire. You know, they are so problematic. Like the one parable that some people read it as simply some Baptist in the American South, I think, love it as some kind of a promoting capitalist spirit. Isn't it that uh, like a king goes somewhere and gives to his servants amount of money, money and then right, right. the two who invested and multiplied it get... Uh, yes, right, are, are praised and the, and the one who, uh, who just uh, buries it for safekeeping yeah. and brings it back out when he comes home is, is, is blamed. Yeah, uh, I prefer personally the reading provided by some minority which claims that we shouldn't accept that the master who does this is a good guy. They point out that the master goes away to grab some power. So that the idea is that although it appears to celebrate the two, the two guys who did invest and so on, mm -hmm. that you should read this story in a much more refined way, that the truly modest guy is the good one. You know, I, th I think in many of, many of the parables, uh, the, the mechanism is... Uh, that rather than disagree uh, with the challenger, uh, Jesus hyper agrees, which is which is just what you often do. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, okay, I'm not comparing you, them with the guy you, you mentioned, you, but no. yeah, I see. No, but, right. <laughs> but you, you you will you will reply to a challenger by saying you're right, and you have no idea how very right you are, and then you then you go on to to deliver you know a version uh, of the position. Let me tell you now something which, which may surprise which is you. A paradox. I yeah. deeply agree with it. I even developed it with the category of over-identification. My idea I, is that every about. ideology to be operative shouldn't go to the end. It has to leave its true implications a little bit in shadow. Mm. So often, a much more effective way to undermine an ideology is to over-agree with it. And I can give you here the series of wonderful historical examples. <laughs> For example, this is why I admire Pascal, Jansenists, and so on. They were too much, theologically. This is at least the reading of that classical Marxist who is deeply sympathetic to Pascal, uh, Lucien Goldman, Le Dieu Caché, Hidden God. How they simply opened up, showed the, the implicit cards of the ruling theology too much. Then I think the same goes for one of my big writers, Heinrich von Kleist, for German militarism, even up to a point Brecht for communism. Mm. And especially, now, this will shock you, uh, Ayn Rand. She is so, oh, cra she is so crazy in her pro-capitalism <laughs> that she is already for the majority an embarrassment. So how are you going to, to hyper-agree with Ayn Rand? Sorry? How are you going to agree... And over agree because with she Rand. says things which are so crazy that that at a certain level, in a twisted way, oh, she, she refutes almost, herself. Sorry, she refutes herself. Not so much refused. That she has an an authentic point. For example, you know, recently, no, I cannot read with all my admiration for her. Atlas Schracht is too much, you know, like, <laughs> because, you know, the last hundred pages, that speech of John Galt to yes, the people, right, right. my God, listen, I know this from communism, it's even worse than, it's basically a party apparatchik, big speech, but there is one moment there which is deeply true, when uh, John Galt uh, criticizes the girl whom he seduces at the end, Dagny, some, and he says, you are the enemy, not the no-doers, because you worry too much. You try to save the system by saying, okay, railways don't work, I will do it, I will try to make it function, and so on and so on. Don't do this. Step back, allow, don't worry other people's worries. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a pretty deep lesson, even political lesson. Then another point where I agree with her, it's even a strictly Marxist point, 
this is a serious problem. You know, when you have at the end of Atlas Shrug this celebration of money. Yeah, but in a way, she is right. This was the problem of the 20th century. Namely, as it was clear to Marx, even if it's only a formal freedom and you have to sell yourself, blah, blah. Nonetheless, money economy at least gives this formal freedom. I say, sell you something, we both have to be in some sense formally free to agree. And her point is, if you want to step in economy out of money, the big problem is how not to fall back into direct relations of domination and servitude. Mm -hmm. Isn't one big lesson of communism, it wanted 20th century Stalinist communism, it wanted to overcome the money market economy, the price was direct brutal relations of domination and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. No, there are authentic moments of, in her. I don't have any problem admitting it. You know, uh, you're, you're talking about that scene uh, and and about uh, saving an ideology by des by departing from the ideology or or deserting it or mitigating its effects or uh, or something of that sort um, prompts me to turn to uh, a paragraph in your book. I'm going to read it. I hope it's me, not the other guy. So let me. It is my part. This because it's it is your part. Oh, it is your part. No, no. I, I was just looking for the way out. If you. <laughs> 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 there is a Jewish story about a Talmud specialist opposed to the death penalty, who, embarrassed by the fact that the penalty is ordained by God himself, proposed a wonderfully practical solution. One should not directly overturn the divine injunction, which would be blasphemous, but one should treat it as God's slip of tongue, his moment of madness, and invent a complex network of sub-regulations and conditions which, while leaving the possibility of the death penalty intact, would ensure that this possibility would never be realized. Yes, that's my Hegelianism in practice, yes. No, don't say no death penalty, because then you get caught into universality an exception, you know? No death penalty, but when we have a really mean guy, let's shoot him. I prefer much more the apparent, yes, of course, I'm for death penalty, just my God, here it doesn't work, there it doesn't work, and you should use all your work to prove that. In general, I'm for it, but in reality, we never uh, arrive at that, at that moment. And I think that even, I think maybe in this book or in my other, the big fat one, Less Than Nothing, which is my life work, if, I can use this bombastic term. Uh, I mentioned another story, which is my absolutely favorite one. And I learned from my Jewish friends that there are even two versions of it. This is, for me, Judaism at its best. It's such a crazy story that first I thought it's a practical joke. Mm -hmm. You know, that people invented this to seduce me because they knew I would like it. You know, there are two versions <laughs> in Talmud of uh, this anecdote of two rabbis debating. Mm -hmm. And the one who is losing said, referring to any hall, you know, the beginning where uh, 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 Marshall McLuhan comes, no? Yes, right. Let's call God himself. And, uh, and, and, and. Oh, yeah, this is a, this is a real Yeah, and, story. and the God yeah. comes, no? Yes, yeah, right. But before he can start arguing, I'm now rephrasing it in a little bit problematic way, but I think if you cut the bullshit, this is what happens. The other priest who was winning the argument, shouts at God, listen, old guy, you did your job, creation, you didn't do it too well, your job is done, fuck off and leave us serious people here to debate the consequences now. And the beauty is that God then says, oh my God, my pupils have beaten me, it's true, and runs away. My children have defeated me. Yeah, defeated yeah, yeah. Them. It's a wonderful story, I think, and this is something absolutely unique for me. From here, then, in Christianity, you go even a step further, and so on and so on. You know, what's the problem here? Please, allow me just to tell this to avoid a misunderstanding. I'm sorry if I give you the impression that I'm now just competing with telling jokes or whatever. This story has a tremendous existential impact. You know, it's easy to treat it as a of funny course. story, but it's very harsh to really take it as an existential truth. Well, it's like, you know, you, I, I began by, 
asking that uh, question about God wanting to see Himself, because <laughs> as as you as you then proceed to speak <laughs> of the Christian of the crucifixion, you say that it is at that moment when Jesus cries, "My God, My God, why have <laughs> you forsaken me?" That God has the experience of being uh, someone who struggles to believe in God, yeah. uh, and at that point He sees Himself. Uh, and from that point on, he can no longer be God in the way he used yeah. to be. So a change has taken place uh, in him, uh, a, a transforming um, change. This uh, Jewish story has a comparable function yeah. in, in that uh, up until that point, God was he who, whose word would finally settle any dispute between two Jews. Uh, and past that point... Uh, God is no longer such a God. They are going to have to settle it among themselves. So the the same the same uh, passage is negotiated in each of these yeah, religions yeah. in a in a different but functionally uh, a parallel way. I think we've um, we, we we're at the point where we can start taking some uh, questions and comments. Um, so from, now we have from the five audience. minutes for democracy. We yeah. pretend that uh, we, we are. Yeah. I've saved actually a little more. Sorry, I, we, I, I'm, I'm cutting. Oh us my off God! Early. Don't give the people too much. <laughs> Twenty minutes of democracy. They will take it. Please, I'm sorry. Please, one, here, one right here. On the black one right here. Actually, one right here. Oh, we've got the microphone up there. I would say we'll follow the microphone. Okay. Ah, you see, you made oh, a I mistake. Need to I told you in advance. I want to live in a Truman world where all the questions are organized in advance. You know. Yes. And now you made a short mistake. That's you didn't right. follow the scenario. Okay. You should have began there. <laughs> Please, I'm Louis sorry. Bunuel said, "Thank God, I'm an atheist." And he probably asked this question to Marshall McLuhan: "Are you an optimist or a pessimist?" Marshall said, "I'm an apocalypt." Sort of like what you're saying, we're fucked. So McLuhan converted to Catholicism as a performance art piece and broke the Finnegan's Wake code. How and why did McLuhan merge technological determinism with manipian satire to come up with the same attitude you have? We're fucked. That's a, is it me or him? You. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, you want to say. <laughs> This is not love for a neighbor. You were brutal <laughs> egotist. Now, this is not love for a neighbor. Now, seriously, first, I don't want to bluff too much. I must admit it that I never, okay, when I was young, he, I was reading McLuhan, but I don't relate too deeply to him. I even have, unfortunately, some problems with, when you mentioned Finnegan's Wake, uh, Joyce. I think he was, I think, in the United States here, conservatives like to say, this about radical intellectuals, that Joyce often wants to be too bright for his own good. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> like, uh, uh, my hero is Beckett. Beckett who, you know, about this mega, you know, like he wants too much, Finnegan's Wake, all languages, everything, and it's, I suspect this disgusting narcissism, you know, like, you know what he said, I wrote this to give uh, uh, liter literary scientists 400 years of work and so on. I love uh, Beckett's, this radical move into minimalist asceticism and so on. So, but on the other hand, yes, uh, for me, my answer to this is that I am optimist for the very same reason that I am a pessimist. Let's not forget, you must know this much better than me, that apocalypse originally doesn't mean the end of the world. It's just mm -hmm. confronting the truth when things it appear. Means, what means it means an unveiling, a revelation. Yeah, unveiling, yeah. So, I, I, so what I'm saying, to give you a very brief formula, is that today, not just in the standard, very restrained, pseudo-Marxist way of economic crisis, limits of capitalism. We are approaching such a point. The old world in which we lived, not only at econ in economy, but even at ethical topic. It's nice that you mentioned this technological McLuhan determinism, because for me, I'm fascinated by, are we aware what is happening today? For example, I'm fascinated by this Ideas which are already becoming more and more reality of the possibility of directly linking our brain to a computer which then can perform movement so that we acquire an almost divine ability of directly moving objects with our thought. You know, 
at an elementary level, this is already done. Like, I read, it was reported, it's ridiculous, this was done in your American way. A totally crippled guy, he was training his brain, and then his girlfriend came and he was able to touch her with his metallic hand, mo uh, moving it. But what I'm saying is that, are we aware of the consequences of this? It's really, as Virginia Woolf said, at some point, human nature changed, no? Like, uh, are we aware that the very basis of our sense of personality and freedom is this minimal distinction. I am here, reality is out there. And, okay, it may sound great, oh my God, with my mind I can move objects. We don't even need the proverbial Stephen Hawking's finger. No, it's direct. But you know, what goes out goes in. That is to say, it's not only out, they can... Con and what will this do to, to, to human freedom and so on? And uh, I claim old answers no longer function here. Like, for me, I wonder if you would share this with me. This was the great disappointment in practically European official state philosopher Jürgen Habermas of Frankfurt School. No wonder that a couple of years ago, he co-published a book with Ratzinger, with the present Pope. Oh. Because he, Habermas, who likes to present himself as the great figure of enlightenment, bringing modernity project of enlightenment to the end, his reaction to all these prospects of biogenetically manipulating our brain, blah, blah, is basically the conservative Catholic one. It's, it's dangerous to do it if, you follow, if we follow that path. We may lose our dignity, freedom, so let's not do it. This is the old conservative Catholic wisdom, you know, some things are better be left unknown. If you, I think this doesn't work. I think that it's crucial to confront all this. My God, what is happening here? What will happen with our being human if effectively what we experience as our spontaneous psychic properties will become manipulable? For example, uh, at NYU, they did something, I checked it up there, because first I read the TV, I saw a TV report, which I find it pretty terrifying. Uh, they succeeded in somehow wiring, connecting to a computer, a simple rat, in such a way that they decoded the most elementary neuronal orders for movement, like straight, so on, and they were able to connect, again, her neurons, to the computer so that literally if you connect the rat to, uh, it really became like this uh, remote controlled toy, uh, you were able to, it's pretty horrifying, to direct how... The, the mouse becomes a real mouse. Yeah, real, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then I met the guys and asked them a simple question and discovered from the very beginning this was this problem and their answer terrified me. Of Hans, course, Hans screw, the, screw the mouse. The problem is, can you do it with humans? Yes, right, no. And especially something. They were not idiots, these guys. This is what bothered them. Namely, how will you, as a human being, experience this? Let's say you did do this to me. I walk here around without me knowing when. You connect me and, and you can control how I move. And their answer was a pretty pessimist one. Their hypothesis, they didn't want to tell me how much is it confirmed, is that I will not experience this as, oh my God, some foreign power took over me, is controlling me, which would have been good, at least I would be aware. Their hypothesis is that I would still think that I'm just freely roaming around, you know, without even knowing. So again, I'm not a mega pessimist here. I, I want to discard both extremes. I'm not like Ray Kurzweil or who, the guy who thinks we will all be happy virtual entities and so on, but I'm not also some kind of technological conservative who thinks the end of humanity, we are becoming robots. We just have to confront problems. Something tremendous is happening. And, and states around the world are already doing it like crazy. Like, sorry if I repeat often this question. When I visited China, I met by chance a top guy immediately. I will finish. Sorry. From, from, from their Chinese, from their Academy of Sciences, Biogenetics, and she showed me the program 
of Chinese biogenetics, uh, genetics where it explicitly says the goal of our research is to regulate the uh, physical and psychic well-being of the Chinese people. Oh Haha, ha, it's serious. Let's take the next question. Please, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, you're not enough. You should dress in black leather and be a domino to me. That's <laughs> the, the only thing that works, sorry. Um, so I'm going to preface my question by saying that I'm actually Catholic and I'm actually a Jesuit volunteer right now. And James so Bond? Jesuit volunteer. So a Jesuit volunteer. Yes. Uh -huh. um, and so, uh, and I studied theology in my undergrad and so uh, with a specialization in global ecclesiology and you had mentioned that bishops in particular were kind of your best debating partners. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, but your example was a European bishop, and I was wondering if you had debated any bishops from developing countries, like the African bishops or Latin American bishops, and if so... Latin uh, American, yes. African, unfortunately, no. Sorry, and go on. if so, like, how, are the, how is that different, or how would you expect it to be different? Because they're a lot less doctrinal-focused, I guess I could, you could say. I don't think that, you know... Uh, Unfortunately, from my, maybe you can correct me here, but from my limited knowledge, I, I still, when you said doctrinal and so on and so on, I don't think this is something bad. Like, I don't like to play some naive but authentic belief against doctrinal approach and so on and so on. I, 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 I distrust this kind of... Uh, uh, I distrust this kind There's of... There's a chapter in the book on the romance of orthodoxy. Yeah, yeah. So what I would Borrowing say is that... Uh, uh, I... Uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, uh, what, what is really emerging as... I know that Catholic Church is getting strong now in some African countries. I also know that if Catholic Church were to be minimally democratic, reflecting its composure of people, then the Pope should have been a black or Latino American guy long time ago. But maybe this will amuse you, but it's a serious point. It's incredible, this predominance of Europea, even more Italian mafia. You know whom I'm now trying to rehabilitate? I'm not kidding. Borgias. I thought they were simply bad guys. Ah. Then I read a good history and discovered, okay, they were not angels, but they were by far not as bad as their reputation. The problem was that they were Spanish. They were intruders. You know, they were not experienced as part of the Italian inner circle. So it's totally forgotten that Borgias, the same horrible Borgias, did many tremendous things, like precisely when Alexander was the Pope, uh, Jews were also thrown out of Spain. You know that Alexander opened up the gates of Rome to all of them, especially to poor Jews, not just the rich Jews bringing money. Do you know that they were the first to expand uh, public education and so on and so on? So, uh, uh, so uh, like, uh, uh, the true, I, in Latin America, it's a different story. Like one of my favorite documents, now that they're slowly opening the archives, you know that already in the early 60s, I read somewhere, reprinted a CIA archive, which said, concerning Latin America, forget uh, Marxist, left-wing the liberation theology church is our real enemy in Latin America and so on, no? In Africa, frankly, I'm not so sure that this new growing Catholic church there has this potential. Maybe I don't know enough about it. You know, these are very complex matters. What happens in with a religion when it is moved, planted into another culture? I'm not here a cheap historicist. Let's take, a, let's take another question in the back. I'm right? sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't, you didn't get the answer, but that's life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I answered you the way God answers Job, which is basically, no, you, you, jo God's answer to Job is basically, yes, I agree with you, this is a big problem. Why all this mess? That's Chesterton's reading, sorry. You, 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 you got the Latin half, but not the African half. That's okay. yeah. ah, you're trying, you're a social democratic opportunist, I noticed. Yeah. You're trying to balance left and right. This, no, is, like uh, some, this is a question, my job. This is a question for both of you. Um, throughout this conversation, you've been sort of approaching the liberational core of Christianity 
Um, I recently read Freddie Perlman's Against History, Against Leviathan. He talks about the Axial religions and their, and their deep opposition to the hierarchical societies in which they appeared. I was wondering if you could discuss why is it that you're willing to, uh, why, why you feel some, it seems like you feel some comfort with the theology and you feel like it's okay to, to continue to, to expand this theology uh, instead of stripping it all away and going back to the liberational possibility. That's, that's sort of the sense that I'm getting. And um, if you guys could discuss uh, your thoughts on, on the liberation and returning to the early church. Sorry, what, what's the last, the last word? Liberation and... and uh, liberation uh, with regards to the early church, Manichaeans, uh -huh. um, uh -huh. Gnostics, uh, the Tao, okay. which is okay. similar, First, similar time. I must say, I'm absolutely... This may disappoint you, but I am absolutely against Gnosticism. I think Gnosticism was, for, uh, from the very beginning, an elitist view. Uh, I never believed in emancipatory potentials of Gnosticism. On page 178, you write, Gnostics are Christians who miss the joke of Christianity. <laughs> no, there I try to be too wise for my own good. <laughs> but no, seriously, what I will tell you is that what I, and I wonder to what extent you are ready to follow me here, what I, you answer, diff, you ask the fundamental question. First, just a minor point. What I uh, reject is this idea of playing the good pre-institutional very early Christianity, like Jesus is good, the origin of evil is St. Paul. No, St. Paul is definitely a good guy for me. St. Paul is the Leninist, in the sense of organizing the movement. And I even am tempted to say without St. Paul, Jesus Christ would have been a rather not too interesting local preacher, and so on and so on. The true problem for me begins later. For example, for me, a truly great guy, much more radical than as far as I know, I don't know a lot, but something I do know about early Christian theology, then St. Augustine is Origenes, the one who, he said something much more intelligent. You know, he's usually known as the crazy fanatic, credo qua absurdum. That's, First, tr that's Tertullian. Sorry? Tertullian. Sorry, sorry, I made a mistake, Tertullian, yes. He was a much more interesting guy, much more radical. Now, the big question is this one, and I appreciate your question. Like, if I even say I am an atheist, why even bother to use the language of theology? Why not do it directly in atheist terms? I claim, as I already said, I cannot, this would have been another Fidel Castro explosion of two hours, why? But you remember, I said this, I claim that to really think the death of God is not a matter of simple atheism. Atheism, the way we know it, Stalinism and so on, still has a theological dimension, some transcendent structure guaranteeing it, blah, blah, blah. And for me, again, this subversive core of Christianity is much more radical in an atheist sense. Why? Because, uh, let me give you a very brief formula. The, here I refer to Jacques Lacan, who said, the true formula of atheism is not God is dead, but God is unconscious. That is to say, it's easy for us not to believe. It's much more difficult, as I mentioned about apropos Kant laughter, to get rid of the, let's call it naively, unconscious structure of beliefs, which function quite well. Nietzsche saw this very clearly, even after we officially become atheists, and so on and so on. This is for me the problem, how to go to the end in atheism. And I claim no way outside, no way to do it outside Christianity. You know what I mean by this? Like the example I gave you from La Vita e Bella and so on. Usually, as a rule, when we are atheists, it's always that we still either need another naive agency or account of it. If you will pardon me. I will repeat a joke which I repeated at least 100 times. I'll do it again. That's my fate, to tell old jokes. You know, don't please be mad at me. You know that anecdote that I use again and again about Niels Bohr, Copenhagen guy who, yes. you know, had a horseshoe above the entrance to his house and was asked by friends, you know, horseshoe above the house in Europe's prestigious item allegedly preventing evil spirits to enter the house. So he was asked, why do you have it by a friend if you are 
a scientist. He said, of course, I don't believe in this, but I have it because I was told that horseshoe above the entrance to the house, it works even if you don't believe in it, no? <laughs> this is how and in that, belief and works. In that, you know, a belief in that works statement. without, and it's difficult to, to go here to the end. The key, here we the need key to element to in that is I was told. So, so it is, there is a mutuality. There is the creation of a, of a sustaining group. Yeah, and the, yeah. and the, that group brings a new reality into existence. Yeah. Do we have time for one more question? One more question over here. Hi, I just had a question. So, um, so essentially, what are you suggesting that uh, that uh, we um, uh, where, where God is concerned that perhaps we live our life dependent upon a fate, knowing that the fate, going back to the Greeks, is just simply the end. That's it. Sorry, sorry. Could you be more precise because it seems to me crucial question. That we are, we are. Um, the examples that you gave. Um, I just uh, is it that we never actually really arrive at a belief? Is it that we are always in the process of naming what we believe, but yet that is inauthentic? That yes. we are always. We yes. Are and again, I I think that the most radical uh, uh, theological tradition knew it. To quote to you Kierkegaard, you know, he said, we never believe, we just believe to believe. But for an authentic, even Christian, I claim, this is not a problem. For me, the guy who believes and really thinks he believes, it's one step from fundamentalism. This is not authentic Christianity. That's the message of that Eli Eli Lama Sabachthani. Even God went through that phase. Even Christ wasn't sure, you know. So, ag again, but again, the problem here is, you know, we don't have time to go into it. What does it mean to believe? Like, uh, isn't it there are good reasons to think that what we usually today consider belief, this full first person literal, I really believe. But this is a relatively modern phenomenon. And Even this is in a form of knowledge and not really yeah, belief. Yeah. For example, I can, maybe you know it, you know a wonderful book by Paul Vane, the French historian, wonderful title, Did the Ancient Greeks Believe in Their Gods? His answer is, of course, in some sense, no. They were not stupid. They didn't think if you climb the Mount of Olympus, you will see there, I don't know, Zeus screwing uh, Aphrodite or whatever. Right. They knew it's just a mountain. But nonetheless, we shouldn't use modern terms and claim, oh, for them, Zeus was just a metaphor for cosmic powers. And no. Socrates, Socrates, who was the man who most undermined the traditional beliefs on his deathbed, hmm? offered a... Uh, instructions to sacrifice a cock to Esculapius. So yeah. the practice remained. Yeah. Christianity is a, so is again, a, this is a practice a very oriented, yeah. future oriented. Yeah. And, and uh, can I just not finish, I promise to be brief, Lady, to, by giving you a very paradoxical example. When I was in Israel, I went to Ramallah and I spoke with some people close to uh, uh, the actual so-called terrorists from Israeli side, some psychologists in IDF dealing with them and Palestinians, and they all told me the same story, which is very interesting, that they tried to understand the mind of a so-called terrorist just before blowing up. They told me, no, it's not that he is sure, oh, the 70 virgins are up there, let me just do it. That It's more a kind of a passage al act to allow them to crush their doubt. It is they are not sure, and it's a desperate act of, if I blow myself up, I will maybe prove with my act what I'm not ready to believe. It's a much more complex phenomenon. Believe is a very difficult thing, and both fundamentalist and Christopher Hitchens type of critics of religion, I think, operate with a ridiculously inadequate notion of belief. Well, we've, we've, uh, we've certainly begun this evening complicating the notion for our own benefit. I want to thank you all for your attention. I also uh, uh, want to urge those of you, and I know many of you are already uh, members of the Library Foundation of Los Angeles, to consider joining and to be uh, consider making your contributions to the foundation as generous as you can. Uh, these conversations uh, by so many interesting visitors have have become an ornament uh, and and an ongoing classroom for all of us. Can I just add something supporting you? First, let me tell you that I'm grateful for you to be here, and this is the most you will get from me. You are not a complete idiot. No, no, no. 
We are all idiots. There are only two types of people, complete yes. idiots and, and not complete. Idiots. <laughs> yeah. And uh, precisely such people like the two of us, not complete idiots, know something. Today, there is this general tendency to turn higher education into factories producing experts, which is why it's absolutely crucial to fight and don't be here false Marxist. You are not supporting bourgeois excess when you fight for free places like conversations here, where you open up to collateral damage, freely thinking. It's not expert thinking, you know. This is so precious to keep places like this functioning, when our universities, again, are turning into machines. Like, I was in France, I was shocked in a debate where some high political person told, referring to that suburb, uh, Paris suburbs uh, burning cars incident, look, he said, this is what we need from universities. Cars are burning in Paris suburbs. We need psychologists to tell us how to control the crowd. We need urbanists to allow us to plan the suburbs better. No, sorry, this is not intellectual stuff. This is experts. We need different questions. We need questions especially to question the questions themselves. You know, the problem is that today we are facing problems, but more often they're not, than not. The way we formulate a problem is the mystifies, problem. is the problem, mystifies the problem. And you will not learn this reflexive ability at, un unfortunately, at, at least what universities are becoming. Every free space of thinking is precious. So I seriously support your proposal. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Slavoj. Congratulations on a fine book. <laughs> Thanks very much. I hope I was not too crazy. No, but I really, I really agree with.